the first trimester is already stressful enough. Now, you may be just getting your first ultrasound report, and again, congratulations, but sometimes the words on that report might be a little foreign. We're going to go over a lot of the common findings that we might see on your first trimester ultrasound, as well as go over a lot of the terminology that we use. Welcome back to another episode of Dude Expecting, where we're hoping to give partners the information and materials they need to be the supportive loved one that they want to be. It means a lot to us here at the New School OBGYN that you're watching our video. So go ahead, give us a like and subscribe because that gives us the motivation to continue to hopefully bring reliable content to you. Now let's get back in to this episode. When an early pregnancy is developing in the uterus, the first thing that we can see on ultrasound would be the gestational sac. We start to see this around the fourth to fifth week of the pregnancy. It's just a fluid filled clear sac within the uterus that starts to expand that inner uterus. While it is a reassuring thing to see the gestational sac within the uterus, we want to see more. And this next really good positive predictor of a normally developing pregnancy would be the yolk sac. The yolk sac is a little small cylindrical sac that baby will use to help survive and develop. And this starts at around week five of the pregnancy and stays till about 10 or 12 weeks until that placenta starts to form. The yolk sac is a really good predictor that the pregnancy is starting to develop normally. Now, the best thing to see is of course the baby. And we call that either the fetal pole, it might be termed on your ultrasound, or the CRL, the crown rump length is the measurement that we do to measure baby at this time. The CRL or the crown rump length is actually the best measurement that we can do in the early pregnancy to give you your most accurate due date. Later on in the pregnancy, such as the second trimester, maybe even the third, if by chance someone hasn't gotten their care in the first trimester or an ultrasound in the first trimester, we might use other measurements such as measurements of the head, measurements of the femur or the leg um, bone. Uh, but the first trimester, the CRL or the crown rump length is your best measurement um, to get uh, your due date. We start to see your baby at around the fifth to sixth week or, and we can get that measurement. And we start to see the heartbeat of baby give or take around the sixth week, maybe the fifth week in a few days, you can start to see a heartbeat. There can be some difficult situations where if someone thinks they're, let's say eight weeks, but their ovulation actually happened um, at a different time, they might be a little sooner on. And if we see just a gestational sac, that can put us into a really difficult scenario where uh, we call that pregnancy of unknown location because we can't quite prove that that pregnancy is in the uterus. And so um, if that happens, you know, you might be have to come back to the uh, clinic in a week or two to get your ultrasound again, just to give baby enough time to develop if by chance your um, dating is just a little bit off. If somebody is getting an ultrasound later on in the first trimester for their genetic screening, and this is called first trimester genetic screening, they might do other me measurements such as the measurement behind baby's neck or the nuchal translucency, we call this. That's um, what we use in our equations to see if baby has uh, an increased risk for uh, potential genetic or chromosomal abnormalities later on. We also use this with the blood test and the, all that goes into the first trimester screening. It's always fun to be there and give the news that someone's having twin pregnancies. So there are a few extra things we might look at if someone's developing a twin pregnancy. Now, it all matters if it's two eggs that are um, fertilized or if by chance it's one egg that splits and it depends on when that egg splits in its development. Um, somebody could have different classifications of a twin pregnancy, which matters a lot for monitoring that pregnancy and the high risk or not of that pregnancy. But there's a few extra things and it's, it's really how the membranes um, and, and how many membranes there are. We probably will talk more about uh, twin pregnancies um, in a future episode where we're going to go over what we specifically look for in the membranes of the developing pregnancies and how that matters for how we monitor those pregnancies going forward. Now, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to make this video in particular was to talk about what's called subchorionic hematoma or subchorionic hemorrhage. It's often what brings the most anxiety when we're talking about this first trimester ultrasound. What it is, is that when, when baby's developing and baby's growing, baby's trying to get blood supply from the uterus and mom, and the uterus is trying to give that blood supply to baby. And then those two surfaces are trying to communicate and form that um, connection to try and exchange those oxygen and nutrients so that baby may grow and develop. 
Now, one of the little blood vessels could open or spill some of the blood, and this would be between the membranes of the chorion, that's the outer membrane that eventually forms the placenta for baby and the uterus. That interface can collect that blood and form what's called a hematoma. If you're out there watching this video and this has happened to you, I want you to know that there's nothing that you did that caused this. And that's the most important thing that I try to emphasize with patients is that this is very common. We don't exactly understand why it happens, but we do know that it doesn't also increase your risk necessarily of things like miscarriage. One of the most common questions I get is, well, what can we do now that we have the diagnosis of the subcryonic hematoma or hemorrhage? Um, and kind of the short answer is likely the body will resolve it over time. Um, but we do often give patients precautions saying, well, maybe avoid vigorous, um, stressful uh, activities, heavy lifting, and maybe even pelvic rest would be a good idea. This would be um, no intercourse, no sex, nothing within the vagina that could push on the area or the pregnancy. There's no medications or supplements that are going to affect or help resolve this. So please don't get scammed out there if someone believes that there's a medication or thing that might help this resolve. Your body being healthy will help resolve this. I also do have the conversation with my patients that have a subchorionic hematoma or hemorrhage is that eventually um, if this blood isn't absorbed from the body, it might actually get pushed out and someone might have that vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy. And it's one of the common causes that actually um, why 20% of women that go on to have a completely normal pregnancy have bleeding in the first trimester is because these subchorionic hematomas and hemorrhages and eventually that might get pushed out. And, and so I just try to warn say, you know, you could have intermittent bleeding throughout the first trimester. Um, for sure, get checked out with your doctor if you are having bleeding. Go talk to them, get evaluated, have baby get evaluated with ultrasound just to reassure yourself that everything is continuing to go well. Subchorionic hematoma or hemorrhage should also not really impact the rest of the pregnancy at all either. If you have any additional questions about this, feel free to leave a comment. I'm happy to help um, guide you for some of that information. All right, now let's talk about if there's an ovarian cyst early on because someone may not have had an ultrasound ever before and now they're having one and they might find an ovarian cyst incidentally. Well, let's first go off and say that it's very common to actually have a cyst for an early developing pregnancy. When a normal ovulation happens, the ovary gives off the ovum and then that cyst that was normally developed starts to, to come together, but it stays there actually and secretes hormones to help support an early pregnancy potentially. And so it's actually pretty normal to have a cyst in early pregnancy. And we call these cysts the corpus luteum cysts. But it is sometimes common to find what's called simple cysts or fluid-filled cysts or even potential dermoid type cysts. And we'll talk more about cysts in a, a video that we'll probably release later this week. Okay, now I'm talking to all the partners again. What can we do to help make this early ultrasound and the information in it easier on yourselves and the pregnant mom? Well, number one, I would say be supportive through this stressful time. And you heard me a lot, but the first trimester is one of the most stressful times throughout the pregnancy for sure. The next thing we can do is be there for that initial ultrasound. Again, this is a stressful time. And if someone is given a diagnosis at that time, such as subchorionic hemorrhage or hematoma, it can be quite overwhelming. So be the, being there for them, but also being there to help digest that information and give reassurance throughout that first trimester is really important. Now, I hope you learned something in this quick recap of what you can expect in your first trimester ultrasound. Again, if you have any questions, comments below. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a great day. We'll see you on the next one.